good evening one and all i welcome you all to the day 3 of international webinar on recent trends in information sciences today we are presenting the topic serverless architecture which will be presented by mr chella palaniyappan he oversees all client engagements of enterprise software development web business solutions product development integration and testing he also works closely with trigens clients in north america from boston the ma office to ensure that offshore initiatives and odc execution is smooth and efficient prior to joining trigent he worked for tata unisys and the national informatics center of india we are happy to have you here sir as a resource person now i welcome you to take over the session thank you thank you very much hope everyone can hear me well and uh, thanks for the invitation to to be with you all today good evening and uh, first of all apologies for uh, kind of a delayed start uh, i believe we had some technical difficulties by the organizers anyway um let me just start sharing my uh, screen hold on a second I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, so, all right. Uh, so, why are we here today? Right. So, I think that's a, the number one question. Um, we we most of us are impacted by um, the corona pandemic as it is today and uh, everything that we know um, has been turned upside down sideways up businesses and communities are struggling to, to, to react to the situation and the challenges that it poses and pivot um, their directions and strategies to, to, to and operating models to, to handle uh, the situation today and i believe uh, you are all as as um, technologies uh, educators practitioners are um, wanting to learn um, new new trends and and what um, the trends are how the trends can help you today in the marketplace and, and in the future so we'll talk about uh, serverless architecture and how why are serverless architectures are more relevant today they've been around for a while maybe four or five years now but why are they more relevant today in the current situation and um, how what the benefits are and we're looking at. We'll take about 45 minutes an hour um, with some group of questions. Um, so what can serverless uh, architecture do for you, right? Uh, first of all, um, one of the big things about serverless architecture is that um, you can build applications um, with a very low, low engineering lead time. Um, Traditional architectures will always have a lot of um, responsibilities that are beyond your application, such as whether it is uh, uh, hosting platforms, um, other underlying systems, containers, whatever it may be, but they all have a lot of other overheads and operational um, responsibilities on you apart from your, just your business. Uh, but in serverless architecture, um, you focus only on application logic. You focus on your application logic, your businesses, and nothing more. Um, so the key aspect is is a very um, low engineering lead time, and of course um, low operating expenses and next to nothing uh, uh, capital expenses. So let's just look at uh, what is serverless architecture, All right? Um, so it can be said as as a, a, a next evolution of a cloud nirvana. Um, it's again it's a, a evolution. Architectures have been evolving. Um, so it's not a, uh, it is not a completely or drastically different. It is, it is built uh, and evolved over what we had known before, we will see. Um, it largely falls on the top of microservices architecture. 
So if you're familiar with microservices architecture, the extension from there to, to serverless architecture, PEC. So the, the key is, is that it removes the dependency on a always on um, computing platform, whether it is containers or whatever it may be, it doesn't require always on instances, but it is just a, a, a compute containers are very short lived compute containers that you can use. Um, they've been around from 2015. Um, I think AWS Lambda was one of the first um, serverless architecture or function, cloud functions started and, and rest of the things followed from there. Today, um, both, uh, not both, all, pretty much every large um, industry um, leader, such as AWS, Azure, or Google, or including IBM, everybody provide you some variation of a serverless architecture and, and, and the ability to support it. One thing to know, know is that the serverless architecture could be a bit misleading, um, meaning you still need servers, right? It is not that the servers are not there. Servers are there, but they're highly abstracted and, and isolated from you so that we don't need to worry about it at all. So uh, let's look at uh, this familiar three-tier architecture um, we are all familiar with, right? So most of us um, who has been programming in a, in, a, in, a, in a web model are very familiar to this three-tier architecture or a three-layer architecture, or way you want to call it. Um, they've been around from early 2000s to, to, to till now, um, right? So the mid 2000s, um, if you look at it, everybody built these um, three-tier architectures in uh, um, essentially in, in, in um, uh, JSP, ASP for the front end, EJB and .NET as, as a middle tier, and either a SQL Server or Oracle kind of thing for the back end, right? So they all, uh, the so same technologies um, that has been in 2000 is, allows you to do that. Today, if you were to build the similar uh, application, you can still do that. It's still, it's possible to build in very, very contemporary technologies still using the same three-tier architecture, right? So you would use, instead of JSP, you would use React, React JS versus a front presentation layer, a front end layer, allows you to do rich uh, applications. Um, of course, HTML, CSS, everything else remains the same. Um, you would write um, the business tier in Node.js, um, gives you extreme flexibility, and you would go to data tier, a Cassandra kind of a thing of, of a NoSQL database that allows you in the cloud. So this architecture is still is, is possible um, to do that even today. Um, but the problem with this is that these architectures don't scale very well, right? So the strengths, if you look at it, um, they have rich front end, um, HTML, CSS, JavaScript framework, whether jQuery, whatever you want to call it, you have um, uh, either from early 2000 um, Ajax to, to today's to jQuery and everything is possible. Um, they're all very good. and uh, fairly scalable middle tier within that middle tier alone, meaning you can add vertically uh, uh, more uh, either uh, hardware, uh, uh, memory, processor, whatever it is, you can scale that. You can also scale it uh, uh, with, with multiple instances. And then the data tier is highly scalable with a database like uh, Cassandra. It, it allows you to scale um, a NoSQL database, allows you to scale uh, millions of users, or millions of transactions fairly easily. But the problem is that is that the middle tier becomes a kind of a bottle uh, bottleneck in, in in our largely in this. There are a lot of problems in scaling with that particular middle tier as much as you can scale it with either adding more memory, more more compute power, compute intensity, as well as as multiple instances. So we can address um, this a uh, 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 bottleneck in a um, variety of ways, but still follow the same three tier architecture. So you would go, what we call, um, you're pretty much familiar, you look at the top um, of the screen, you have client and a, a complete application on the database, right? So you have a client which is accessing the application and the application uses of database in some sense. The three-tier architecture can be um, changed into, the same three-tier architecture can be changed into something um, more scalable by first you add a, a router or a load balancer, right? So the load balancer, um, is able to uh, balance the application traffic into multiple instances. So we, let's say you, you spin up multiple instances of the same application. Um, this is pretty popular in the hosting model, right? Like everybody like you essentially had 
uh, multiple instances spun up and, and you run your application on it and the intelligent load balancer is now able to load balance across these multiple applications and everything else. Uh, you can also do one other thing, which is a partition um, the client itself, right? So in that sense, meaning uh, a client, you can separate out each client um, to a separate instances. So client A uh, can go to uh, instance A, client B can go to instance uh, B, and so on and so forth, or a multiple combination. Those intelligence are built into the load balancer. Uh, they, the load balancer allows you to intelligently distribute across multiple instances. And the database uh, also somewhat separated. That's what we call the sharded architecture, meaning the data is sharded across different databases. Uh, so this is, it's essentially the sharded architecture um, scales the three-tier architecture to horizontal partition, or what we call, typically call shard, the middle tier, and databases at the storage level. Uh, typical SaaS providers in the early days have done this um, when, even when it was also uh, worked to their advantage, when the SaaS provider needed to have data isolations for some of their paid premium clients, they can do that using this, uh, this structure. Um, so it's fairly, fairly um, allowed a good amount of scaling. Um, for example, uh, Slack kind of uses this architecture. Slack uses the a, a large PHP architecture with memcache uh, wrapped around all its um, database, uh, 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 MySQL databases. And um, the way that uh, Slack is able to do that is, is essentially they have some of the principles of our mechanisms of the application, right? Meaning a Slack team never shares um, across other teams. So each Slack team is self-contained. So they can assign that Slack team to a specific instance and the data can be removed residing in a one single database, so there's no real, there's no need for them to scan multiple instances and so on. Uh, but the problems are, there are other problems with this kind of architecture. Um, the problems are, the, um, one of the problems is, is essentially uh, no comprehensive view of data, meaning if a SaaS provider wants to uh, aggregate information from multiple shards and provide intelligence in some, for some way, um, they're unable to do that. Uh, also, shards uh, fail at some point in time because the database it still uses a single instance of a database. And when the database becomes too, when the data data becomes too large for the database, they're going to have difficulty in scaling that. So one way of handling that would be a typically a, 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 a read replicas and a, 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 a write master, right? So essentially, it writes to one database instance, and all of that is replicated to multiple instances. And then, um, then now the application can do multiple reads from there. The principle is somewhat um, um, different, meaning like you, this works very well when you have less number of writes and large number of reads, which is most applications follow that particular pattern. Um, applications in real life applications write less and read a lot from the database. So it works when you have um, read replicas and, and write masters um, to help you with scaling database itself. So now you've seen, okay, you can kind of scale the middle tier by having multiple instances. You can scale a database to some extent by doing these three replicas and write masters and including memcache or any caching or any of those things. But it still is, is you, you've got to run into difficulty um, because it still doesn't support a, a extremely large uh, implementation. Um, now let's also step back and see other trends in the software development itself, right? Um, so SDLC methodologies, uh, software development lifecycle methodologies has evolved from the 80s and 90s to 2000 now, like neither from waterfall to spiral to V to, to today we are in uh, uh, DevOps mode, right? Agile um, paved the ways into DevOps and we were now into DevOps. But even with DevOps, um, when you talk about developments and deployments at scale, which we kind of talk about like, you know, hundreds of teams and thousands of deployments per week. That's a scale that most large uh, companies operate today, right? Um, they need a good amount of processes, Agile and Scrum, um, CI, CD, DevOps, all of that is in there. You need a good organizational structure, which is um, small teams, autonomous teams, teams that can, can act independently. Uh, and agile may, right? So agility should be uh, the ability to 
configure strategy, process, technology, everything. So meaning like a team can choose their own technology and operate it and, and focus on creating value and, and, and opportunities like that. Um, one of the things is also the small teams, right? Um, Jeff Bezos uh, uh, coined this term of a two pizza teams, meaning if you cannot, uh, if, you, if you cannot feed a team by just two pizzas, that means your team is too large, meaning typically like you know, six to eight people. If there's anything larger than six to eight people, then you shouldn't be, you shouldn't have that larger team, you should break it down. Lastly, um, architecture, right? We need a good architecture, which is you know, microservices, serverless and containers. Um, in order for you to do this kind of a, a, a hundreds of teams and thousands of deployments per week kind of a situation. And we're gonna focus on serverless today as a, as a, a mechanism to do that. Um, it builds on microservices. We wouldn't be talking about containers. We will talk about serverless only, okay? So um, let's focus for a while um, what we call as a scale cube. Uh, the scale cube is a, is, a, is a concept or a way to understand how applications can be scaled. Um, so the applications can be scaled on a typically on an exact x-axis, which is horizontal duplication, right? Which is what we saw earlier. You had the middle tier, which is uh, multiple instances of the middle tier. We uh, we had multiple instances of applications spun up on different hosting uh, environments, different VMs, different containers, whatever it may be. You want to call it right or different EC2 instances, whatever it may be. So you you spun up multiple instances that allows certain amount of scaling. For the next amount of scaling is the data partitioning. Um, so data partitioning is, is what we talked about as a sharding, right? Uh, essentially you partition the data and um, in, in a large sense, for example, you could even think of that as um, uh, Netflix or, or Facebook uh, trying to do, let's say all users from Netflix in India would go to a different server than the US server. So all their needs are only served from there and all users of the US could go to different region, right? So you can partition the data either by region or by different way, as we talked about in Slack, it's partitioned along the Slack teams. In other SaaS uh, uh, instances, they could partition on, uh, along the lines of clients or something like that. So that allows us to, to have a, a Z axis of scale. Lastly, the Y axis scaling is uh, done by functional decomposition. The functional decomposition is to, to break up the application into smaller applications or smaller uh, services, right? You now have to break up. So, so far till now, we talked about application still as being one large application. It is not broken down any other way. The Y axis or the functional decomposition is what provides us the the next level of decomposition, which is typically is the microservices architecture that you see. So microservices architecture tells you essentially to break the application into, into smaller services and I'll, uh, allows you to build it. So uh, microservices as defined by Martin Fowler is, is what is given here. The key is, is to um, that services are uh, focused around business capability and a large amount of um, automated deployment and intelligent endpoints. When we say intelligent endpoints, we basically mean um, APIs that are intelligent, uh, interfaces that are intelligent, and lastly, a, a, a high amount of de de decentralized control, meaning a smaller team can make decisions for that particular service and decide what technologies they want to use, what functionalities they want to use, how they want to use any anything. Right, so that's that's the definition of a, a microservices. Uh, the large, um, these are the uh, characteristics of a typical microservices um, architecture. Um, the big thing is is the separation of concern, um, which is um, what work the software performs. It should be based on, uh, it should be separated based on the work it performs. Let's say if you look at uh, some application that does, uh, let's say. Um, you know, e-commerce application that does authentication. So authentication should be completely broken down and run as a separate microservices, right? So that microservices provides only authentication services, whether it is um, coming from web or a, or, a, or a mobile application or any other uh, third-party integration that, that service provides authentication and separate. So separation of concern is a key component in, in that the software should be separated based on the, what the work it performs. Um, and different parts of the application should also be uh, 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 encapsulated 
so as to insulate from the other other parts of the application right so each component becomes encapsulated by itself and by encapsulation they isolate themselves um, or insulate i wouldn't say isolate insulate them from other application services so they are they don't get impacted by changes with other application services um, also, um, this is a, Netflix is a great example of microservices. Um, in late 2000, um, 2000s, I think 2010 or something like that, they moved from uh, large monolithic application to architecture, to microservice architecture. They were able to deploy thousands of code um, sections uh, every day to support the hundreds of millions of sub subscribers. Um, large uh, 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 companies, um, scalable companies, Uber, Sof uh, Spotify, all of them use microservices architecture, and that's a way that they can scale, right? So if we go back to our, a couple of slides back, where you have hundreds of teams doing things and thousands of deployments per week, and that's a way to do it. So there's hundreds of teams, or each each team is responsible for one or more microservices. They decide um, what goes in, how they run it, how they operate it, everything else is independent, uh, fully, Fully autonomous teams by themselves. Because these components, these uh, microservices are small, uh, virtualization is easy. Um, small code bases, quicker deployments, they're able to deploy quickly. So that again comes back to thousands of deployments per week. Um, you could also, um, um, because it's it's insulated and encapsulated, you want to make changes, um, whatever the uh, uh, changes that you need to make. Um, within the application, within the service can be uh, easily done. Uh, services are separate. You can um, scale them easily with different technologies. Um, some other technologies that came along, which is containers and allow, uh, uh, other technologies, allow these kind of uh, architectures to, to grow very well. So for example, each, uh, each service could be in a, in a container or a multiple container for managing with them. Lastly, um, the polyglot programming. Uh, which essentially what it means is that each team can choose their own language of choice or technology tools of their choice and everything else. Again, going back to the team's uh, uh, autonomy and independence means that they can choose the language, they can choose the choice of tools, they can choose their uh, code pipeline, uh, tool pipeline, whatever that may be. Um, right. So let's look a very look at a very um, how actually it looks in a, in, a, in a system, right? So let's look at a monolithic application. So this, let's consider a, a web uh, uh, e-commerce, uh, web commerce kind of application, right? So you had a client application. Um, it could be, when I say client application, it could be a mobile application. It could be any other, other application, third-party application. And you have a browser um, through which most of your users come in. You had uh, uh, UI, storefront UI, which presents, so it's, you can just think of it as Amazon, right? So you can think of it as Amazon. The UI of Amazon presents you all the uh, uh, nice widgets, colors, fonts, all those things present information. Largely, they tend to be static information, graphics, images, text, those kind of things. And then in your, let's say your application, for just simplicity's sake, like, you know, we have a few modules, right? So you have authentication modules, obviously, for to you to for your users to authenticate and, and and credentialize themselves before they do any any transaction on your on your site. Let's look at let's say there is a catalog module which allows you to look at the catalog module provides you the list of uh, products that they sell on the on the platform. Um, that's the catalog module. Lastly, let's say you have um, um, you have a you have a reviews module and order module. The reviews module allows your users to write reviews. We want to see Amazon uh, reviews. Um, the order module uh, allows you to make actual transaction orders, uh, buy things from there, and they're all supported through a database um, on the back end. So this is your typical monolithic architecture. In a microservices architecture, um, it changes a bit, right? First of all, we, we move the storefront UI, which is a large amount of static information, right? To, to something that is not in your application. We'll move it out. Let's say, for example, in the AWS situation, we move it to AWS S3, right? Simple storage um, services, S3 buckets are highly scalable um, services. So we don't serve your static HTML pages or uh, images or any of those things. They're all moved to uh, S3 services, and now Amazon is responsible to scale all of that. 
and we are left out with other uh, modules, which each of the module now becomes a, a, a service, right? So you have authentication uh, service, catalog service, review service, and order service for each of those things. And each of them are separated by, each of them supported by its own database. So because each service is self-contained, meaning that they need to have their own, um, their own, their own, their own database also. So it's fairly simple to, to move from this monolithic architecture to, to microservices architecture. Um, so some of the things that you need to, we need to see is that in a monolithic architecture, it does everything, right? It is, it is like it's the whole application is one um, ball of wax, as you can call it. Um, they, that does everything else, everything, and and it has a shared release pipeline, meaning like if you change, make changes to one module, then you have to deploy, redeploy all of the modules, and the, um, any changes to one module potentially impacts other modules. And it is very difficult to change the technologies, meaning like if you want to introduce some check technology, because it is so many modules are, 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 are included in there, you need to consider all of them. Whereas in the microservices, it is not the case. It does only one thing. Each service does only one thing, and they can be independently deployed. Uh, for example, in the, in the monolithic architecture, you can think of it, let's say, if it is running on a, a Tomcat server, you would know that you would, run a, you would deploy a whole jar file, a war file to redeploy your application. Whereas in a microservice, it is not the case. You can you can redeploy a specific services without impacting other other services or anything like that. So you have a lot of independence um, ability to, to um, deploy, scale, and all of that. Uh, lastly, each services could be using their different technologies because they run in different containers, they run in different environment. All of that could be um, different in terms of um, uh, independent other modules that. All right, so what are the big advantages and the drawbacks of microservices? So one of the big advantages is, is, um, is, a, um, is it's a, a ability to use multiple languages and tools, right? Meaning uh, for as a programmer, the polyglot uh, 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 aspect of microservices architecture uh, is drawn by the larger teams. Each team can make their own choice of tools, languages, and program it, whether somebody wants to program it in Java or, or C Sharp or Python or, or Go language, whatever that may be, they can choose that language and they can write it. And you can also select languages that are appropriate for a specific aspect of the business logic, right? And, and each service is well isolated by logic and technology. So because of the logic isolation, um, the, uh, services can be uh, much more independent. Because of the small footprint of the services, they could also be fast iteration. We can iterate, um, release, um, build, test, deploy in a much faster iteration. Um, impact on a one particular microservices doesn't impact any other services. So you have a fairly high degree of fault isolation. And, um, and they all tend to use a, a better resource utilization. And, and because it's, it's broken down by smaller services, you operate smaller teams that are responsible services. What are the drawbacks? The biggest drawbacks is, is that microservices uh, do insert a certain level of complexity, right? Uh, developing a distributed system is complex. It is not um, a monolithic application as a single flow of things. You can easily um, um, design and, and implement a flow of events like a work but a distributed uh, system is, is, is um, higher, uh, introduces complexity. Um, partial failures are, are very difficult, uh, meaning your, your services could be based on various other things, but a business, business transaction sometimes could be spanning multiple services. So let's, let's assume a situation where your, your business transaction um, need to span three different services in your architecture and um, out of the, after the two services, third service failed. So that basically means that you have to go back and clean up the other two services because the third service failed. Uh, so that, that brings up a higher complexity of handling these partial um, failures. Um, testing is also fairly complicated. Um, distributed systems are not so difficult, not so easy to test 
because they're distributed, they run in different containers. You cannot um, easily debug and flow through one to another one and step through the uh, uh, sequence of events and find that. So it, it becomes difficult. Um, largely, operational overheads are high. If you had a single uh, uh, application, all your logs uh, will be coming from one single application. Now your each service is generating its own log files, its own um, trace routes and everything else. Then you need to analyze all of them. You need to now perform health check on multiple services rather than one single application, right? So if you had a one single application, you could have just perform a health check on one single application as to how much memory it consumes or what it is doing and like what its profile, all of that. But now that can't be the operational over overloads are fairly high, you need to be looking at each of these services independently. So these are some other difficulties or drawbacks of active services, right? So that leads us to a serverless architecture. Uh, so what is a serverless architecture? So if we look at um, the same um, diagram that we looked before, right? The, the first and foremost is, is the, the what remains the same. So your, your um, mobile and browser interfaces, REST, um, uh, uh, HTML, and REST APIs remain the same. The storefront UI, which was delegated to a S3 kind of a bucket, that remains the same. But next comes the, the you had a, a, a load balancer kind of a thing, and that load balancer uh, is now changed to API gateway. We'll, read, we'll, we'll learn about a little more about the API gateway. So the next um, important thing is that look at the authentication module is also removed. So we don't no longer want to do the authentication module. The authentication module could be delegated to, to something like a, a, a Auth0 or a Cognito, which is a cloud service, right? So we delegate that to a cloud service provider. We don't do that anymore. We don't want to, there is no, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a completely undifferentiated heavy lifting, right? Meaning like you don't need, there is, authentication module or the authentication. But there is nothing unique about authentication and, and user ID passwords from one application to other application. So why do we want to quit focus our energy there? So we'll move the authentication module to, 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 to external um, services. Um, we talked about Cognitor or Auth0. Um, so the other thing is that, as you see, is essentially uh, each of the services becomes a function. Uh, each function has its own database and each of these functions. And the API gateway now becomes a lot more uh, intelligent. It, it does little more than just uh, uh, load balancing. The gateway also can include certain amount of uh, routes and points um, to different configurations, um, which it can find it when, the, when it receives a request, it finds the routing configuration matches the request. And the uh, 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 so uh, function based backend route, it can call the relevant appropriate functions with the representation of the um, original request. So it will call the function with all your HTTP request parameters and everything else, and in either in a JSON object or whatever it may be, and then call the function directly to that. So functions get pretty much all your HTTP context through the API gateway. So API gateway does a lot more than the just load balance. Um, it, HP Gateway can also perform certain number of authentication and and do, do a little bit of a validation into validation. So HP Gateway is when they say authentication, it is not necessarily a user authentication, but essentially to make sure that they are the requests are coming from a designated well-known sources. Like now you can define okay, these are the from the public domain, these are the browser-based requests that can come in. And you can have defined um, other third-party application integration where that can come from a mobile interface or a third-party interface where those things can come from. So there's a, a, a large amount of um, intelligence that has gone into the API gateway. So this, in essence, is the serverless architecture. So before we go further along, let's look at a little more as to where this fits in in, in a traditional um, environment that you know, a kind of a model that we have seen. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the, with the service delivery model that has been around for a while now with the cloud thing, right? So from the left to right, if you look at it, like the left is on-premise, then you had infrastructure services, and then you have platform as a service, which is essentially all your AWS and other things. Infrastructure as a service is essentially all your, all your data centers and the hosting provider, right? The platform as a service is, is, is your is your um, Azure's of the world and the Google cloud computing or AWS of the world is providing the platform as a service. 
And next comes the serverless. So serverless is, is between that and the software as a service. Software as a service is essentially um, providing somebody is running everything else and just providing a service, which is like a Salesforce or, 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 or a, let's say, or a Flickr or, 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 a, or anybody else, right? So essentially they provide services, but they, you don't operate, you just consume those applications just through the browser. So serverless comes in between that. And as you can see in the serverless, what you manage is only the application. Um, everything else is managed by the vendor or the platform provider. Uh, just in, in any other the typical service delivery model that we've seen before, they also um, uh, essentially um, from left to right, um, um, it, the complexity gets reduced, right? When you're running your own on-premise application, the complexity is higher, your overheads are higher. And everything else and as you go to a software as a service or a serverless your complexity is reduced and from right to left it, it provides a lot of customization so you know you know let's say in you know, a salesforce you have a very limited ability to make a customization but if you're running sugar crm on on prem you could probably change the code and do a lot of customization so it gives you a lot more control but it depends on whether you need a kind of a lot of so, so I just wanted to give you an idea of where serverless fits into in the typical service delivery model, because I think most of you are familiar with this, this on-prem uh, infrastructure service, platform as a service, and a software as a service models and how they relate to each other. Um, there are two types of uh, serverless architecture that you come across, um, or typically in the, in, 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 the, in the material where you would see um, anybody in, in like, so the one is a backend as a service, uh, or one is called as a BAS, and the function as a service um, is known as a FAS. Uh, BAS is, is a, a, a most suited for mobile application uh, because these mobile applications are very self-contained. Right? You can look at, you could think of any mobile application. The apps run on by itself. Most of the apps are capable of running even when there's no internet connectivity. So they're self-contained and everything else but they all require some amount of server-side logic, right? Meaning, let's say, when you have, um, um, when it may, it may need to store certain data back in the server side, or it may require additional processing on the server side. But it is, it's very uh, focused and, and everything else. And so the BAS is, is, is mostly used by mobile application, and now it's typically called as a mobile backend as a service or an MBAS. Uh, examples are uh, Firebase, Back4 app, all those things are uh, uh, examples of such uh, uh, provider. Uh, they typically provide a lot of uh, ability to do storage related work and uh, 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 social engagement, meaning you can, you can, they would provide user authentication, sign up, um, um, delete their account, log in, uh, and push notification. Uh, push notification is a very important thing because most mobile applications require a server-side logic to do the pushing um, of notification in order for them to keep their resource utilization low. They don't want to be doing polling, they want to be doing pushing. So there's a certain amount of push notification to be done and all of that is provided by the PaaS or M PaaS services. Um, but a FAS uh, uh, it, uh, is all what we call a function as a service is the true serverless. So when we talk about the rest of the conversation, um, when I say serverless, I really consider only FAS as a serverless architecture. The BAS has got a, a, a lot of limitation. I, I really don't consider that as, as a so true serverless architecture. Um, some people do have the same opinion, some people don't. Um, but for our conversation today, um, I would be talking about serverless architecture focusing on functions as a service or a FAS. So the FAS provides pretty much everything of BAS, but also provides a fully managed uh, stateless compute container that can run any custom code, right? It can run any code that you want, it can run on any which way you want. And, and the containers are stateless and containers also ephemeral. When I say ephemeral, uh, what it means is essentially they're very, very short it's not very, very short-lived. We'll, we'll look at it a little more closely. Uh, but they are short-lived when it compared to typical applications, um, application that you, you're, you're, we are used to, right? So um, to, on the same note, when we talk about there are other technologies or other terms that are thrown around typically, like, for example, containers, container-based um, Docker and container-based uh, technologies and everything else, Kubernetes and all of that, provide some of these aspects, but they still are not, I wouldn't call them as a serverless architecture. So in my opinion, um, 
for and for the remainder of this conversation today. Um, so, so SaaS uh, is is the, the primary serverless architecture that we are seeing. And also uh, to keep it simple, um, I would be talking mostly with with relevance to AWS and AWS in implementation of the fast which is Lambda. But in in terms of uh, you would see the same thing in Azure Functions or Cloud um, Google Cloud Functions. They all provide a very similar um, uh, mechanism, and they are very similar in nature. The mechanics vary, uh, implementations vary, but they are very similar. But for our conversation again, we'll focus on the Lambda uh, implementation AWS. So the biggest problems of of um, uh, uh, serverless architectures are uh, there are a few problems, right? We talked about a lot of benefits, but there are still a few problems. One of the things is, is stateless. Um, stateless, because the functions are very short-lived, uh, they're ephemeral, um, they're stateless. Because it's stateless, um, you it provides certain amount of limitations on application logic, what you can and cannot do. Um, typically, stateless applications can be still made to work and function properly using um, events. Um, external data stores, um, like no, your NoSQL databases or any of those things. And lastly, um, um, complete um, caches like Redis, which are across application caches like Redis. Right? So they, they can, we can use any one of those things to, to, to overcome the stateless uh, of the application. Um, problems also, there are multiple other problems when, when um, consistency, um, data constancy, right? Data constancy is, is essentially, consistency is, is essentially when you want to have a consistent uh, information across multiple databases, right? Because we talked about each functions having its own database, each service having its own database, now you, uh, you have a prolification of databases, and all of them have to uh, be consistently pointing to the same information and not um, different. So the, those are those pro provide um, uh, certain problems. Um, typically, um, this is this is um, references a cap theorem, which is which is um, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance are the three uh, parameters, and out of which you can only achieve only two at any given time. That's kind of the theorem. I mean, it's it's a long um, uh, com uh, computer science uh, um, aspect of it. Um, you can look it up. Uh, so essentially, any application um, can only have two of those three parameters, which is consistency, availability, or partition tolerance. But you can overcome all of them through different mechanisms. So that is a, that is a problem of maintaining this uh, data consistency. Um, Two-phase commit, as we typically know in the traditional data, uh, database um, developments and other places, like oh, very highly needed in, in financial transaction, Right, meaning you need to be able to do multiple transactional commits before all of them can be committed. That's what is called a two-phase commit, right? So you do independent commits and then collectively you you bundle all of them and commit uh, again, and, and that is becomes difficult in in a in a situation. But all of that can be um, can be overcome to a large extent. Um, lastly, because of the statelessness, you you need if you need to do a sequence of events. Um, let's say a, a workflow kind of event, um, then it becomes difficult to do all of that within a single single function. And you would you would now break that into um, each function and create a chain of events, and you can you can do a transaction like that. The next uh, limitation of a serverless architecture is they are short-lived. So we talked about short-lived as, as one of the uh, uh, aspect of the Angela. serverless architecture, yeah. Thing. Your screen uh, upper left upper part is not visible. It is actually step by step. It is coming. Uh, how long has it been like that? Yes, yes. All slides are like that. Okay, let me yes, stop and see. restart. Yes. yes, 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 yes. Now it is right. Now it's better. Yes, yes. No, best, best it is. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I didn't, I didn't do anything. Anyway, all right. So good. So. Oh, I, apologies. Um, if it has been like that, somebody should have told me. I'm long back. Sorry, apologies. I don't know. Has it been like that for, for a long time or just now? Anyway, we'll continue. Um, fine. So uh, when we talk about a short-lived, we talk about a, um, um, as aspect of the application that it is short-lived, right? So, um, but it's also limiting to some extent, meaning like you know, now because of the functions are small, you cannot um, write 
code that that requires a long processing time. Um, the reason why the platform providers have done that is, is to provide integrity of the platform. So they don't want any services to be running in a in an un, uncontrolled fashion, spinning CPU cycles and and, and crashing their system. So they go to they got to take care of that. And in AWS, it used to be five minutes till about uh, last year. Now it is 15 minutes. Um, so 15 minutes is a fairly a big time in a compute time, right? So this is actually 15 minutes of compute time. Um, so if your process is running longer than 15 minutes, it automatically will be terminated. But most business transaction, um, which 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 is this is this is more than sufficient in in practical purposes that we have seen. Uh, we work with a number of clients. Uh, for most of the clients and most of the pro uh, needs, this is fairly sufficient. Um, but it's also good advice for um, for people to to change and and control. Uh, if you think that a, a, a process is going to be running longer, to separate that into, into multiple smaller um, uh, functions. The last um, um, limitation is is what we call as a, a cold start latency. Um, the cold start latency, before we understand cold start latency, let's look at a function life cycle. So let's say uh, a, a request is made to Lambda's API for to invoke a particular function, right? So AWS now will receive the request to start a function, and then it'll look and say, okay, hey, do I have a warm environment available? And if there's a warm environment, which is a, a environment for the, the, the function to be run, if it is available, then it immediately invokes the handler, and then it, it uh, completes the invocation. So that's a typical warm start. 99% of the, the transaction would complete in the warm start. But, but there are also um, new, uh, when a new request comes in, sometimes you can go into a cold start. What is a cold start? So cold start is if there's no warm environment available, it has to, um, now AWS as a platform has to go uh, create or find available compute resource. Right now it has to create environment where, where the, the, the function can be run. Now then it has to download your code, your function code into that environment and then ex uh, start execution environment. And next, your functions initialization, some initialization needs to be done because as you can define before every function gets run, you can specify certain initializations to be done. So those initializations needs to happen. So it has to execute the init. And now then it has to invoke the handler. So this adds a, a latency, uh, right? So the cold start includes um, a, a longer duration than a warm start typically. And, and because of that, um, there may be application, may be situation that a cold start is, is adding a, uh, delays into your application that you need to be aware or you need to take care. Typically, this, this um, um, it's, it's, it's not a, a, a problem because about 99% of your traffic would be um, supported to the one start. There are very few, about a 1% or a few percent of your traffic would be need to go through the cold start um, routine. So it is, um, it is not a problem. And AWS also has done um, additional um, things in the last few years. I think last, last year they introduced this, essentially a pre-warmed environment to reduce cold, uh, cold start. They also can have um, what is known as a provisioned concurrency, meaning like you know, now you can provide a certain number of concurrency and say like, okay, I want to have at least 10 warm start environment available at any point in time. So those are additional costs to that, but you, it, it allows you to have some so that's how um, one of the limitations, and this limitation is how we can overcome this limitation. Now let's look at how typical um, applications are uh, AWS Lambda functions are executed, right? So the invocations are three different ways. One is a, a push, um, which is through uh, API gateway. Typical, the push is the most common um, thing in a traditional application scenario. You could be your, uh, your Browser-based applications could be invoking a Lambda function through calling a, a, a API gateway, and then it calls the function. So that is typically uh, uh, what is known here. I mean, what is indicated here is uh, calling a, a REST API from your from your uh, browser. Yeah. Again, the thing is coming from the left hand side. That side oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yes, now. I don't know why it happens. Anyway, I, I just didn't do anything. I just touched the screen and goes. Okay. Anyway, let me let me okay. keep keep an eye on that. 
All right, good. Thank you. Um, so there is a uh, so when you have a um, typical push is is, is uh, um, calling the function serverless functions from your um, browser or any other API. The next is the event. Uh, event is a the uh, uh, you can in AWS you can define a multiple different types: asynchronous, um, uh, invokes, place. Uh, those are asynchronous. You can, you can, let's say, for example, in the case of a S3, you can say every time a file is uploaded, um, invoke this particular function, right? So you, once you define that, you don't really call, you just play, you just upload a file automatically in the platform, which is AWS will know that um, the file is uploaded into S3 bucket, and it's gonna call a particular function to process the file. Uh, that's the event. Lastly, there's a pole based, which is a stream based. So you can use uh, Dynamo DB streams or a, a Amazon Kin Kinesis uh, a stream, or including or a message queues, right? Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 SQS, uh, simple queues uh, services, uh, is a message queue services provided by, um, by um, Amazon. So any of those um, message services can be used to invoke a Lambda function. So now that we know three different ways uh, a Lambda function can be invoked, let's see how the application itself can be built. All right, so this is a, a, a um, I, I hope you can see the screen now. So this is a typical a static website. Um, so I, let's look at a, a, a static website, which is, um, when I say static, it's really not completely static, but majority of the assets are um, HTML and, and images and PDFs and maybe other audio video files and things like that. But there's very little logic that you're doing. Right? And for example, my employer Trident um, owns our Trident website, Trident.com, is, is built on the same thing, which we use uh, AWS serverless architecture and this particular architecture kind of thing to build our thing. So in, in, in this, um, essentially um, all the static content, which is HTML, CSS, and images, and everything else is, is um, um, on the S3 bucket, and um, which is now supported through the CloudFront, which is a, 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 a content delivery network, right? A content delivery network like such as a CloudFront now caches all this information and able to present that to any different, different geographical regions at the uh, uh, edge centers in the past. Um, but we do need some amount of dynamism in the application, right? For example, um, when a visitor comes in, you want to take the visitor's names and everything else, and, and they can probably fill in a small form saying, like, no, okay, contact me kind of a form that will allow you to get this information from them and then, and then pass it on or something like that. So those are things that like, no, we can implement it as a simple uh, Lambda function, and the Lambda function can be now, can store the data into DynamoDB, and uh, once it is done, it could also um, use something like a, a, a simple notification services to send out emails. So SNS is, is, is allow, which allows you to, to send out emails. Lastly, you may also have a certain amount of um, um, two-way. Two One, you can provide a walled content, meaning like for some people, let's say, for example, um, we want to provide some visitors, the ability to download a white paper after they provide uh, use, I mean, provide their information. So you typically would have seen it like, no, you, oh, you want this in the white paper, register or, or subscribe for our newsletter to get the white paper, right? So things like that. So you need to have a particular um, form to fill in. So the way it is done is that essentially, um, they, uh, when you click a download link from the um, HTML pages, um, uh, API is called to the Lambda. The Lambda function creates and sends back a signed URL, which is in the S3 bucket. So the, all our content we talk about, they're on S3 buckets, or a PDF file actually resides on S3 bucket, but they're not completely visible in a public way. They need to be, uh, um, those URLs need to be signed and given. So we have a signed URL and, and send that back to, to, the, to the visitor. Similarly, when a visitor wants to upload a file, let's say, for example, one of our visitor wants to contact us and upload some files to our site, the same way the function would create a new S3 location and send back the S3 location to, to the browser, and the browser now uses the S3 location to upload that. Once it's uploaded, um, the browser now calls back another uh, uh, Lambda function to invalidate the S3 bucket, and, and everything is now taken care of. 
Now let's look at a little more com complex web application. This is a very simple static web application. Let's move to a complex web application, right? So a, a complex web application um, could look like this. It is, it is now not, um, it's just not only, um, it's not only uh, uh, accessed by a browser, but it is also accessed by a mobile application, APIs, um, including voice service devices such as uh, Alexa Chat or Alexa uh, Echo or anything like that. Um, similar things we have seen as before, um, um, very um, similar to what we have seen in the past. Um, before, just in the previous slide, we use a CloudFront, which is a, a content delivery network, and um, we use uh, S3 to serve content. Um, static content, but we also now starting to, to consume other services. Um, we talked about how our authentication service was delegated to the platform, now Cognito, which is authentication services, or a, a, a identity access manager, IAM, uh, AWS or AAM, also can be leveraged to use your uh, authentication services. Now, most of the uh, uh, request that is coming from a web application or a mobile application, go through to the API gateway to a Lambda function. Now the Lambda function can store most of those things either in a DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL DB, or in a relational database also if it chooses. But it also can use Elastic Cache or any other caching mechanism to, to do a lot of other scaling. And other things. At the bottom, you can see the voice service devices, for example, uh, 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 Alexa uh, skills, can directly call the Lambda function without going through the API gateway. So you can configure the voice services to, to call to the Alexa skill, and the Alexa skills now can directly call the Lambda function and so on. So this is a, a more compli complex web application, can support typically any kind of a, a modern web application that you would have to do with this. All right, so um, next, let's look at a, a, another, uh, a, a, implementation, which is typically an IoT application. Most today, um, a lot of applications today are in, in IoT kind of a model. So an IoT platform, um, again, we, we're leveraging AWS's IoT platform, which is a powerful IoT framework. It supports MQTT and other um, protocols very easily. Um, so let's, in this, the first and um, top one is the people coming to the web, which are typically users. Users do access the system to some extent, but they typically come there for either for provisioning, activation, or some kind of like a reporting and those kind of things. So they come through that um, web and then um, go to the API gateway to, to invoke any other functions and do that. But the devices themselves at the bottom, um, um, you would see they can send back, uh, sending small volumes of data to AWS IoT, right? So they could be sending data every five seconds, every 10 seconds. There could be thousands of devices. They all go to uh, IoT topics, and the topics, um, we can use the topics and topic filters to route messages uh, from which are the publishing clients to subscribing clients. They could have a multiple pub sub model to, to route this traffic from IoT devices. Now, you could also define IoT rules, and some of the IoT rules, depending on what, let's say, uh, it, it, could, you could, it could be anything. It could be saying, okay, like now if I have IoT devices are, if they are uh, devices that are coming from your car, they probably have a different processing, but as against the home network, which is lights turning on and off would be a different kind of a thing, right? So those information that is coming are filtered through IoT rules, and some rules can directly um, go to uh, and a, a Lambda function to invoke or do certain specific um, aspects of the, the, the execution itself. Or some, some rules can just take it and just take the data back from the IoT device and just directly store. So they don't, they, they, they can directly go to IoT actions and then actions can store it to the database itself. So that's, that's a very uh, high level architecture for an IoT application. Um, next we can look at um, what we have as a, a, typically as a real time processing, right? In the real time processing, um, um, you can think of real-time processing as, let's say, for example, you're, you have an application that is doing um, collecting information, social media tags, hashtags from social media, and process them, and let's say looking at trends uh, uh, and other trend analysis. So you could, your uh, Amazon Kinesis um, can, um, uh, Kinesis Stream collects all the hashtags, and it triggers the events. Those events are now 
uh, invokes a Lambda function. Now the Lambda function can process the hashtags and, and store certain information in the DynamoDB. And now they have become available for uh, social media trend analytics and other things. Similarly, you can look at images, right? So for example, um, you have a, let's say, I don't know, it could be Facebook, Flickr, or even Google Photos, whatever that may be, right? So you have, um, when you take a picture on your cam, I mean, on your cell phone, um, if you have Google Photos, you can probably, you can set up to, to sync to Google Photos automatically, right? So once it is done, how the Google Photos on the other side has to process these photographs for various other things. So the way that is, let's say, for example, in this case, it is done is that essentially the, the, the devices themselves upload the images to S3 buckets. Once they're on an AWS S3 bucket, they, they trigger an event. Now the a Lambda function can um, take those images and perform certain functions. Typical functions are you want to be able to create a thumbnail, you want to resize the images, you want to do other analysis. Typical analysis are like an image. Um, if, I mean, for example, in, 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 in Google Photos, it could do even uh, facial recognition to see if, if uh, who are available on those pictures or to indicate and say, hey, these, these are the pictures who are people. So there are a lot of processing that may happen. All of that is done and, and back it is stored back in the S3 or whatever it is. And all of this could be just done by the Lambda function itself. So these are the real-time processing or streams processing or image processing is extremely suited for Lambda functions. Now you just run the functions. You're not running a huge instance of application. You're not running a separate VM. You're not running a separate uh, EC2 containers, any of those things. You're just running the, uh, these functions. So they're highly scalable and highly um, optimized. So I think we come closer to the, um, 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 this, all of the architectural uh, pack, uh, uh, differences uh, using serverless architectures, we have seen it like a multiple of them. Now let's look at a couple of other things which are essentially what are your, um, what need to be your development configuration, right? So before we go and do development, you need to be uh, familiar with, uh, you ought to be familiar with certain things. Like you know, the FAST supports a number of languages, um, AWS and every one of the providers are um, uh, somewhat different in, in the languages they support, but they, all of them support multiple different languages. So you can, you can, you can, you could use um, Java, JavaScript, Go, uh, PowerShell, Node.js, C Sharp, any of the number of things um, are supported. But in case if you you if you have a language preference that is not supported, then that is a problem. So you got to be careful about what language your choice of language is supported by the platform, and also your favorite IDE. Right? Meaning everybody is using their own IDE or their their own toolkit, and how it supports applicability uh, sometimes is uh, different. So each one, uh, Visual Studio has a great support for Azure function. Um, and whereas the AWS code pipeline uh, provides a lot of support for land applications. So there is certain amount of um, um, dependency on your tool sets that you need to use. Uh, there is a certain uh, amount of vendor lock-in, right? meaning once you build these applications on AWS um, Lambda, it's very difficult for you to migrate from one to another. Yes, those are the logic itself is, is in a language that is um, you could use, meaning like, now let's say you, you, you programmed it in Java, it's, it's a Java language, you can take that and run it in there. But outside the language, a lot of other things that you need to do, which are very highly dependent on the vendor or the platform. So it becomes difficult from moving from, from AWS to, to Azure or something like that, from AWS Lambda to Azure functions, it's kind of difficult. I'm sure at some point in time, these providers would um, uh, would have some tools that makes it easier. But right now, it is a, it's a, it's a uh, effort that uh, programmers or, or developers need to do that. Um, but the on, the on the other side is that most companies, most corporations do go through a very well thought through uh, ideas of their choice of um, choice of uh, cloud cloud platform. So they they're unlikely to move from one to another. Um, there is a, a gentle lack of standardization. Um, there is no standardization in Azure function, in, uh, 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 a serverless architecture of the functions, how the functions are handled. There is some um, um, development that is happening. Um, Red Hat, Google, and IBM are, uh, are pushing native, which is a, a which is container orchestration based on um, Kubernetes and other things, but it is still is not very mature and everything else. 
Um, lastly, you you need to be using versioning and aliases uh, to deploy functions um, when you're working with multiple developers. You tend to have multiple developers. You need to have different functions, different versions, different aliases to make sure that all of that is you're not impacting on anybody else. In a typical situation, it would have been very easy because you would run it and in, 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 in just um, have version control on your code um, when you're just a simple uh, GitHub or something like that. But this goes beyond that and there are other things that you need to do. Um, testing consideration. Testing is also somewhat is, 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 is difficult. Um, I think there's a lag. Uh, are you seeing testing consideration screen? Okay. So uh, testing any distributed application is inherently very complex. Meaning, like you now your uh, testing is 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 a it's a single single application in a single container is much easier than uh, testing an application that are, are distributed across multiple multiple instances, multiple containers, and everything else. So it becomes very difficult. Um, testing teams need to be have very good um, understanding of individual function, testing individual functions as a unit, and then the choreography between them, and end-to-end -end business transactions. So they need to do a lot of other, um, like you know, what we traditionally call as a uh, unit testing, integration testing, and uh, assistant testing. Kind of thing. So that's, that's very, very important. So they need to have testing that covers all three aspects of it. Event-driven architecture is also difficult to emulate, uh, meaning um, it's asynchronous in nature. So um, that kind of asynchronous um, um, invocation becomes difficult. Um, um, so you have tools such as AWS X-Ray and other things to help you with that. Um, Visual Studio has an ability to debug uh, functions locally, uh, even from a cloud-triggered event. So some of those aspects are supported by the platform, but some may not be. Um, applications also need to look at cloud services, which becomes difficult when you're doing it um, in, in, a, in a local environment. When you're running it in your application on your desktop or something like that to, de uh, to deploy and test, it becomes difficult. Um, AWS provides a, a serverless application model, um, essentially called a, a, a SAM. Um, SAM provides a lot of toolkits. It, it allows you to run serverless functions locally. You can run the API gateway locally. You can also debug the functions locally. So those, these becomes very um, helpful, but essentially there are no comprehensive testing tools or debugging tools to support serverless architecture. So that becomes a very um, um, a large amount of concentration before you build uh, enterprise scale applications that requires a lot of testing and, and, and quality, quality assurance efforts. Um, finally, the summary is um, Amazon, uh, AWS CEO said that if Amazon.com, which is their, their the e-commerce platform, if they were starting today, it would go serverless. And that's what it is. Um, so the serverless architecture allows us to focus on the business logic and your businesses. And it allows you to release features and functionalities faster. Um, it allows you to scale tremendously uh, without any, any uh, high cost implications. Um, when I say tremendous scaling, these are, we're talking about um, hundreds of thousands of users and hundreds of thousands of transactions in a you know, time uh, scale like um, Netflix or, 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 or Facebook or, or anybody else. That level of scaling um, is very highly possible with serverless architecture. Lastly, it also removes inefficiency. Um, it allows us to move to greener computing, meaning um, in, a, in a typical model, um, analysis indicated uh, most uh, enterprise applications use only about 10 to 15 percent of their uh, uh, compute capability that is that is provisioned on a cloud platform, right? So you could have EC2 instances and everything else. Only 15 percent of the EC2 instances are used in a in a overall in a period of let's say few, six months to a year. So that results in a lot of uh, wasted energy, wasted wasted electricity, and everything else. So it moves to a much more greener, uh, efficient um, computing. Um, so that's all. Um, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Otherwise, um, um, thank you very much for calling me, inviting me to, to, to talk to you guys all and, and present this to you.
how do we handle questions? I think Paul. Thank you, sir. Shall we have uh, two question sessions now, sir? Sure, please. Yes, yes, sir. Please. Let me read the question, sir, then you can answer. Sure. Yes. First question, sir, can all microservices be customized? Um, so I think I, I want to answer two ways. Um, so one is I think they I, I, they may have asked about microservices as well as um, uh, functions, right? Yes, uh, microservices and functions are completely customizable. They are your own code. They are as actually your application that you write. Uh, in that sense, they are not any different. So yes, you can build custom applications. Um, you can write custom code, and you can in in choice of your own language. You can write it in C sharp. You can write it in Java, you can write it in Python, um, any of the language of your choice, you could write the application. So yes, microservices as well as function or a, a serverless architecture, the functions within the serverless architecture are highly customizable and you write custom code. Yes, Second question, is monolithic services more secure than microservices? Um, Yes and no. No, I would say no. Um, uh, monolithic services um, are not necessarily inherently more secure than microservices are our uh, serverless architecture. Um, again, um, one of the uh, uh, one of the things that we talked about is that ability to, for example, if you are writing monolithic application, uh, one of the inherent point is that then you become responsible for uh, managing um, security and authentication and identification, all of that, right? So essentially, you need to keep, keep track of the user ID, passwords, authenticating them and everything else. So because you need to write them uh, because it's a monolithic application, they live within your application. But now microservices are in, 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 in uh, uh, serverless architecture, you can delegate it to a cloud provider. In that sense, when I say we can delegate to a cloud provider, we can use a R0 or a Cognito kind of a services to delegate it. But the, the advantage of delegating it is, is now, right? Um, earlier, because you were doing it by yourself, let's say you were doing it only by user and password, right? That's all. And and you use only user and password, nothing else. But now it is delegated. You can delegate to a different service and you can also simply enable a two-factor authentication. Right Now then the platform provider is going to enforce the two-factor authentication, meaning that now no longer a user and password, but now user and a password and either a device or any other biometric or something like that to use multi-factor or two-factor authentication. So there are higher availability of making your application much more secure in a, in a microservices architecture or in, 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 a, in, a, in a serverless architecture. That was not as part of, in, 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 that was not available to you in a monolithic. But beyond that, uh, as an architect, every architect should be very careful in, in their security uh, implementation, making sure that their application is secure. But what is available for the platform is inherently uh, a high availability of uh, additional capability available from microservices or from um, service, serverless architectures. Sir, another question. How an identity and access management is done in serverless environment? Right. So serverless environment, essentially, you, you want to delegate that to a platform provider only. So identity access management, you typical serverless architecture, they don't do it by themselves. They delegate it into, into, into the cloud platform. It is possible to manage it on your own, but typically in an AWS situation, uh, you will delegate that to Cognito services and you can you can define the Cognito services to, let's say if it is a closed environment, a corporate environment, you can map it to an AD, uh, Active Directory kind of environment or any other federated uh, authentication system. But uh, broad sense, 
um, you want to delegate to the platform provider. You don't want to manage it because if you manage it, then you you need to write a service that is scalable, functional that is highly, highly scalable, and that becomes another event uh, 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 interjection of another event that you need to handle. So most um, recommendation would be that you delegate um, identity and access management to the platform, but the platform like AWS provide you a variety of um, ability to do that. Whether, like as I said, you can delegate to any federated services, you can delegate to do Active Directory, uh, ADFS, um, any of those. Sir, is there any specific reason for the function name Lambda? <laughs> I don't know why AWS names uh, Lambda. Um, I guess I don't know really. No, uh, I don't think there is any reason. They may have quirky backstory to it, but I'm not aware of one um, why they call Lambda. But uh, they all AWS services have uh, uh, somewhat of a quirky uh, naming uh, kinesis to, to 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 Lambda to whatever, right? Yes, if there is one, if there is a reason, I'm not aware of it. So. Yes, yes, that's right. Whether this architecture limitation that is short lived takes more time for transaction means that will lead to network traffic. Right. So it is. It's, it, it's not going to um, lead to a lot of network traffic, but the short lived transaction um, it basically uh, pro, uh, makes your your application development a little bit constrained. Uh, earlier, you can write a, a one big module that does everything from start to finish in within a one one large module or a function or a, or a whatever it may be, right? One one unit. Um, now that is not going to be possible. So you probably have to break it down into smaller pieces. So the functions themselves may be small. Again, we we are talking about now a fifteen minute limit. A fifteen minute limit on a compute is an enormous amount of time. So um, most programmers don't need to, to really worry about it uh, because you, you, the things that are going to go, I mean, typically, let's say, for example, um, in a web application, web application users are, uh, most users are, um, most users are essentially not going to uh, accept an application that, that takes beyond, let's say, a few, uh, few tens of seconds, right? So for, 20 to 30 seconds is the expected response time on a web, web page, right? You click something or you navigate to a menu, it is supposed to refresh and load and everything else. It's like tens of seconds, maybe a minute. Um, so most of your application on the back end has to have completed within that minute of time. Now we, we have 15 minutes of our function on the back end. So you can, can confidently build anything like that. The problem becomes only when you have a large number of batch processes. Those are cannot be done in a function which maybe then, then you need to look at other things. So um, network traffic, that is not a problem, but in terms of complexity and how you uh, break down and how you program, yes, that would be an issue that you need to take care of. Uh, so what way cloud infrastructure like G cloud is different from serverless architecture like AWS Lambda? Yeah. Could you re-ask re me that question once again? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What way cloud infrastructure like G Cloud is different from serverless architecture like AWS Lambda? Okay, okay, okay. All right. So, uh, the, so when you say G Cloud, that essentially Google Cloud Platform, right? So Google Compute Platform, Google Cloud Platform, is the same as AWS. They all provide the same, which is what we talked about as a platform as a service, right? They're also adding this new um, serverless architecture, which is Lambda, or uh, Google Cloud has a Google Cloud function, right? G, uh, cloud functions. The same way Azure has got um, Azure functions. There, the, the serverless architecture uh, capability within the uh, platform as a service provider. So if you look at it, um, then AWS, Azure, and Google Platform, Google Cloud Platform, they are the platform as a service names of the, the three from the three vendors. And Lambda, Azure Functions, and Google Cloud Functions are the names of the um, serverless architecture from those providers. Yes, sir, you have covered all the questions. Now, on behalf of the management and the PG Department of Computer Science, I would like to thank the resource person, Mr. Chella Palaniyappan, 
for gracing today's seminar. Thank you, sir, for your very informative and insightful presentation. Thank you, sir. And thank, thank you very you. much. Yes, sir. It, it thank was you. a wonderful talking to everyone. And uh, I again apologize for the delayed start at the beginning of the uh, things. Uh, people stayed back. And uh, thank you very much. And you all stay uh, safe and uh, and uh, yeah, have a uh, rest of the great rest of the evening. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.